ready. Sorry for my tardiness. Um, welcome to the March 10th, 2020 regular uh, meeting of the East Bay Mud Board of Directors. Um, the planning, only the planning committee met earlier today and will report out later under item 10. Um, please uh, give us the roll call, Madam Secretary. Directors Coleman. Present. Katz. Present. Lenny. Here. McIntosh. Here. Mellon. Present. Patterson. Present. President Young. I am here. All right, please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have one presentation. Alex? Right, so uh, thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, the State of California um, Reciprocity Partner uh, Bronze Award that uh, we're being recognized, that, that Beverly Johnson uh, is being recognized for. Uh, and normally we'd have a board member present this, but we have a guest with us uh, here from the State of California, Donetta Jackson. So I'm going to read this, and then Donetta will come up and present the award. So the district was recently recognized as the State of California Reciprocity Partner of the Year Bronze Award winner for our work promoting uh, use of small and disabled veteran businesses. The district's small business component has been based on the state's small business definition and incentives since 1999. Since that time, the district has formalized its relationship with the state as a recognized small business, disabled bu veteran business enterprise reciprocity partner. The district regularly participates in Department of General Services outreach events to share the district's contract equity program and upcoming contract opportunities. The district is honored to be the first recipient of this new award, along with the Gold and Silver Award winners, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District and the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, respectively. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Donetta Jackson, uh, Business Outreach Program Manager with the State of California Department of General Services, who came all the way from Sacramento to present this award to us. And then, uh, so, Beverly, you're welcome to step forward to accept it on behalf of the district. May I add a few words just for, on behalf of Beverly? I just want to say that um, East Bay Municipal Utility District, they did receive the Bronze Reciprocity Partner of the Year Award. This was our first year presenting this award. And East Bay MUD has been a reciprocity Reciprocity partner with DGS since 2014. Um, in the past year alone, your organization awarded $44 million to over 400 different small businesses through 2,000 contracts. Your contract equity program sets ambitious goals to contract with small businesses and has recently expanded to include DVBEs. So I think that's something to be proud of. And without the work of Beverly Johnson and her team, this could not have happened. So I congratulate you. I congratulate your um, organization on such a great accomplishment. Yes, I had been, I had been uh, thinking that uh, Director McIntosh would, would, she's on our Legislative Resources Committee. You always get the opportunity. Good. Beverly and team. Okay, uh, we have no announcements from closed session, um, and that brings us to public comment. I don't have any blue comment cards, but if there's a, any members of the general public that would like to address the board on a matter not on the agenda, now's your turn. So come forward. Okay, um, on to 
to consent calendar. Um, we have eight items on the consent calendar. I don't believe there are any that we are pulling, unless it's the pleasure of the board that we do so. Consent calendar. We got a motion and a second from Director Patterson. Moved by Director Linney. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That. Um, those with items on the consent calendar may depart at this time. Um, and we'll now move on to determination and discussion um, items. And under that, we have just one item our uh, number nine, our general manager's report. All right, so we have um, several items that we'd like to cover this morning. The first is a water supply update, and our manager of water operations, David Briggs, will provide the update. Why isn't it raining, Dave? I'll get to that. It's going to. You told me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Risha. Uh, good afternoon, President Young. Good afternoon, members of the board. Um, things, things change rapidly. I, I, the whole tenor of this presentation that I was thinking about this morning changed when I got the most recent news about mid-morning that uh, the, the forecast for the next 10 days has, has gotten a lot better. So we'll quantify that for you here um, as we go through the presentation and your, your update for March 10th. So beginning with uh, the water production values, which the, as we've been saying for the past month and a half or so since, since early February, with the dry weather that we've been experiencing and the warm temperatures, our water production left off the table there and departed from our uh, line that it was tracking last year, which is the green line from fiscal year 19. The red line is, is what we have to date in fiscal year 2020. And for a brief period at the end of February, uh, we were actually exceeding the average from 05 to 07, which was our uh, historic high for water production. But as I was ex explaining to Director Coleman right before the meeting, uh, we did pick up a few tenths of an inch uh, over the weekend, and it has been cloudy, and it has, you know, we have had some precipitation. The response in the service area, I think, has been pretty sharp. And I think that tells me that people are really paying attention. So just in the last three or four days, as you can see, the water production has really fallen off the table, heading back down to the green line, which is what we saw last year. And with an unsettled pattern forecasted for the next 10 days or so, with more precipitation coming in, I think we're going to cruise right back down and join that green line again. So uh, real, real interesting response. I would also say that most of the increase uh, that we saw in the last six weeks in water production has been east of hills, which would be indicative of irrigation. And then uh, just looking at the precipitation up country with our four station index, uh, things will hopefully improve uh, moving forward. But looking backward for the last two and a half months, uh, January uh, over two and a half inches, February not much. Uh, in fact, February was the, the lowest we've recorded in our watershed over the last 85, 90 years of hydrology that we have. Uh, February was the lowest. January and February upcountry were together the third driest. And so you can see January, February, March, about three inches of precip so far for the first three months of this calendar year, whereas normally, on average, we expect to see, I'd say by the end of March, maybe 24 inches. So dramatically lower uh, so far. Uh, but as I said, uh, we have an unsettled pattern. The last forecast that I saw a few hours ago, we'll see if it materializes, is predicting four inches of precipitation in the McKelmy watershed next week. And that'll translate to about uh, 12 or 18 inches of snowpack at the higher elevations. Four inches in March, as you can see on the chart, will make a huge impact in where we are uh, as we get through the rest of this water year. So we'll see what happens. The storm doors open, we'll see how many storms come through. Uh, the storm that is coming in is a cold one. Down a, the snow level will be down at 2,500 feet. Wow. It's not an atmospheric river with a, with a big moisture tap, but still, it, it should be a good one uh, after not seeing anything for about six or seven weeks. Locally, where we stand today, things are not good. 39% of average locally. Uh, we saw a tenth of an inch over the weekend, depending on where you were in the East Bay. Uh, I know where I was in Oakland, we saw three tenths of an inch, but our, our index in the watershed picked up a tenth of an inch. We got a few more depending on uh, tenths, depending on where you were. Uh, we recorded zero in February. That we've only done that once, uh, so that tied for worst. But still, about two inches of rain since New Year's Eve has is, is been pretty low. Uh, but we will uh, the forecast that I mentioned for upcountry that translates to about two inches here, which again will make a, a pretty big 
extent uh, in our progress in March. And then looking at the snowpack, as you know, uh, most of our snowpack arrived around Thanksgiving, first couple weeks of December. We saw a significant part melt in the, the, the temperatures and dryness in February. Uh, we haven't really accumulated much. But as you, as, as you can see here, the, this year is shown in red. I uh, wanted to emphasize and contrast this snowpack uh, against 2018, two years ago, which is shown in black. Uh, we started off very, very low in 2018. Uh, we had a miraculous march. We uh, came up, got a halfway decent snowpack in 2018, and I think and I'm hoping that two weeks from now we'll come back and you'll see the red line go up uh, by 12 or 18 inches or so and get, and get a little bit more of that back. So we'll see what's to come, but that'll, that'll be very helpful and I know a very welcome sight. And of course, that, that also has the double whammy of knocking um, irrigation demand down. So we'll, we'll see that benefit us in two ways. <coughs> be that as may, right now, most of the hydrology indicators that we have up country are about 50 percent. Uh, snow depth, water content, precipitation uh, in aggregation throughout the watershed is about 50 percent of normal. So this is hopefully uh, the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, and then from here hopefully it'll improve uh, while we get through the rest of spring. Storage is 591,000, almost 592,000. Uh, it's down about 10,000, 8,000 acre feet since the report from two weeks ago. So we are dropping, the river is only two, 300 CFS right now, the river is quite low. Uh, so we are losing storage. And the, the middle column there, the one that shows percent of average is a bit deceiving. That looks at first glance like things are in pretty good shape. Uh, your percent of average of storage looks really good. Uh, that of course is more of a reflection of last year coming into this year with full carryover. And it doesn't quite show what runoff is to come obviously. So. If we do not get into a wet pattern, if we don't get more snow, if we don't get much more precipitation, we will have very little runoff this year because the snow that we have right now is quite low. Um, it is more or less confined to that upper, upper elevation of the watershed. So we, right now we are not anticipating a lot of runoff, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but these numbers will drop if we, uh, if we don't see a change in pattern here with some, some real precipitation. Dave, if so I looked ahead at your deck. Um, Let's assume worst case scenario, what would our end of year storage be in September? Um, do you want me to cut to the chase and get to that right now? Um, about, I would say low 400. I would say okay. somewhere between 400 and 450,000 acre feet. If it did not, if do we anything. got zero, I understand your question correctly, no more precipitation. Right. Yeah, below 450. And I'll, I'll elaborate more on that in a second. So taking a step back, uh, looking at the whole state, uh, the graphic on the left is the whole water year, beginning back in October 2019. So uh, central, northern Sierra on the dry side, some very dry. That's the whole water year uh, getting progressively wetter and better as you go south and east. Uh, the graphic on the right is just February. And we pretty much set records everywhere. I, we didn't get any precipitation in the central part of the state, central Sierra Bay Area, I don't, I don't know if they got much at all in Northern California either. It just did not, we just didn't see anything. So it was an extraordinary February by all, by all stretches. Um, and now this is a slightly different way of looking at our precipitation to date up country in the, in the watershed with our four station index. So what you see here in the gray, light blue bars are the 10 driest years on record, and unfortunately 2020 is on the far left. Um, now 2020 is not over yet, uh, but we are right now looking up at 1977, which is uh, kind of a disturbing vantage point. Uh, but we have two more months in the water year. Should we get five more inches of precip, that would correspond to a drier type of hydrology. As I said, we have four inches forecasted just in the next week. We'll see what happens. Uh, but if we track a dry hydrology, at least we'll get past 1977 and avoid the, the distinction of having the, the driest year on record. Uh, it would take the, the median value, if we get median precipitation for the next two months, that would correspond to about, uh, about eight more inches, of eight and a half more inches of precip. That's median from here forward. That'll still get us into the top 10, or the, I should say, bottom 10 club. It won't get us out of this uh, top 10 uh, or bottom 10 uh, runoff year or precip years, uh, but at least we'll avoid uh, uh, setting a record. So that shows you where we are relative. This has been an extraordinarily dry year. 
uh, and it's just by virtue of our carryover storage that's, that's uh, giving, uh, mitigating some of the water supply impacts. Dave, just to pause a little bit so that it doesn't seem too um, uh, extreme, the 1977 was preceded by 1976. So we're really, and I'm speaking to a board that's well aware of this, but maybe just pointing out for those that are listening, um, that, that was two back-to-back -back dry years. We're at the beginning, and we still have a couple more months left. So uh, not to go right to panic, but Dave will talk about where we're, what we're doing internally here to be prepared just in case. Things do seem to go in twos, though, just noting even from this chart. Yes. And so, so this is where it all comes together with carryover storage, runoff to come, and then various forecasts depending on what hydrology you want to look at. So this is storage, and right now we're at 591,000 acre feet in the early part of March. Now, moving forward, and this gets to Alex's point, um, it, it, if it does turn wet, it has not been wet, but if it does turn wet, it is still possible. We could actually end the year with full carryover storage, which is somewhat astonishing, but it is actually possible. That's the blue line there showing it getting wet, our storage coming back up and ending the year with 630,000 acre feet of carryover storage. The next 10 days look more like the green line, median level hydrology. That would still keep us well above 500,000 acre feet where we would be contemplating taking various uh, actions related to supplemental water. So we, even the median will keep us well above 500. Um, if this is just a brief interlude with uh, an a unsettled pattern and we go right back to what we were seeing in uh, January and February, we may track the red line, uh, which would take us below 500. And then Director Coleman mentioned the zero precipitation scenario, which is highly unlikely. And we, again, we have four inches pre uh, forecasted to come next week. If that were to come, we would be below 480,000 acre feet. That being said, we have a range of options here uh, that, that, that will be in between. And, uh, they, they're separated by 150,000 acre feet. Uh, so uh, it remains to be seen. We've got two months left. It is looking much better. We don't have a high pressure ridge parked over California right now. We are definitely in an unsettled pattern. It just remains to be seen how much comes through the door. Uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, we're preparing for all scenarios that we might see and we'll walk the board through it when those times come. Uh, the updates will continue and we'll, we're scheduled to bring the water supply deficiency report to the board the second meeting of April. That's right. So we will keep you updated as, and keep your fingers crossed. And Dave, just so, I mean, I think everybody has been through this because the drought wasn't that long ago. Our trigger for um, de deciding that we're in dry and and at, at the, the the first stage of dry would be below 500,000 acre feet, and that uh, action all the way down to 450. Our organization uh, has a uh, drought management plan that would have us in messaging to our customers to voluntarily uh, um, reduce their water consumption to use water wisely, and we'll have to have a conversation. Actually, I hope we don't have to have a conversation, quite frankly, but if it gets to that, we'll have a conversation about the difference between where we are now in terms of customer consumption, which is way down uh, compared to where we were before the last drought. So what we expect from our customers will, will be different now in terms of percentages than uh, what, or, or quantities than what it was when we were having this conversation at the beginning of the last drought, just to preface that but we're going to work it all up so it's easy to understand for the end of April. Okay, thank you. Other questions? All right. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Thank you, David. So the next item that we'd like to uh, have a presentation on is the status of our <laughs> efforts as it relates to public safety power shutoffs, uh, which will position us to deal with... Uh, the potential that we have a very dry period and that PG&E wants to turn off the power to avoid wildfires. Good afternoon, President Young, board members. Uh, just continuing the happy topics. Um, Kelly Zito and I are gonna share with you our plans for the 2020 PSPS season. And really our plans build on the successful plans that we had last year. Um, just a quick recap of um, last year. So PG&E had nine PSPS events Four of them could have potentially affected our service area. They canceled two of them. And what you see in the table here are the two events that um, we did uh, have to experience. The first one was on October 9th, 
And the second one was on October 26th. October 26th certainly um, was the largest of the two events. Um, and you'll see both of the events affected the upcountry, some facilities upcountry, but really um, the first event, that one upcountry facility was just a gauging station, so not terribly significant. The second event did affect more facilities upcountry. Um, the graphic of the maps below just show you the, um, the uh, two events and just kind of the affected area. So on October 9th, uh, that affected 43 pressure zones. And just as a reminder, we have 125 pressure zones in our um, distribution system. So on October 9th, that was about 30% of our pressure zones were affected and about you know, close to 97,000 customers. On October 26, we had 73 pressure zones. So over half of our pressure zones um, were affected by um, the PSPS outages and almost a quarter million of our customers. Um, as far as we know, the triggers remain the same um, as far as for a PSPS event. So that's a red flag warning, low humidity level, um, sustained winds of 25 miles per hour and gusts up to an over 45 miles per hour, um, and then also dry fuel conditions. Um, now, both the CPUC and PG&E, they've expressed that they like to see more targeted and shorter outages, um, but the reality is we have to plan for longer outages and broader outages because they haven't messaged that that is actually going to happen. Um, as far as our preparation, um, we're going to build on the mitigation plan that we developed last year. Uh, we've incorporated the lessons learned from last year into our plan. Uh, we will have staff conduct some tabletop and field exercises just to refresh them through the whole process. Uh, we will continue to test our backup generation at our facilities. Um, and then we do have a meeting planned in April with PG&E to understand what their plans are for this year, um, as well as share with them some of our expectations going forward for this, um, this season. As far as our response, um, we will, just like last year, pre-deploy equipment. Pre-deploying the portable generators and the portable pumps um, that was critical to our success for our response. We would not have been able to respond in time had we had to deploy all the um, equipment when we were notified of the outage. Um, during the event, we will coordinate with PG&E. Uh, we'll maximize our distribution storage, um, and then we'll implement our PSPS communications, and Kelly will go over that in a minute. And then we'll activate our EOT to coordinate our response in the field. As for the backup equipment, um, we do have an existing fleet of 32 portable pumps and generators, um, but given the scope of the outage, we're going to need to rent generators, and we do plan um, to bring a rental generator contract to the board for consideration on the 14th. Um, we looked at options for cleaner burning uh, portable generators, and the reality is uh, there are no portable generators of the size that we need um, that doesn't run on diesel fuel. Um, the other thing that we looked at, you heard Dave talk about the potential for the dry year. We looked at the last two decades worth of uh, wildfires in California and matched them up to the dry seasons. And we looked at where you had a dry year and then also a drier second half of the year. And in those instances, there were two instances where there were wildfires in June and July. So the other thing that we do plan on doing is have those generators ready um, as, er uh, up as early as June. Um, and if we wait too long, there still is a lot of competition for the generator. So we don't want to wait too long and not have the ability to rent the generators. Um, and How many generators are we going to be looking at in April 14th? We're looking at 30 generators. So one more than we had last year. So Cliff, if, if and is PG&E still projecting that this is going to be 10 years? They are still telling us uh, 10 years. So at what point are if we assessed um, when it makes sense for us to um, buy more generators? Um, that is in the next step. So we will be bringing a contract um, and doing an RFP to purchase some generators. Um, it does make sense for us to look at purchasing some generators, not 30, um, but some number of generators. The other thing that we're going to be doing is um, looking at a multi-year generator rental contract as opposed to doing this year by year, because we know this is going to last at least five to 10 years. But we do expect that hopefully by year 10, there's going to be a lot fewer of these PSPS outages, and they'll also be short, smaller in scope. Um, <clears throat> do we have any more money in our seismic account that we collected? Because this would be applicable in a major earthquake to be able to use the generators for that purpose, too. Uh, I don't have that. I mean, we, you, as as uh, the board is aware, we. Uh, ceased collecting. Right, but I don't know if we still had money sitting in it that was 
We do not, okay. And that was a number of years ago. Did somebody answer that? Yeah, yeah I thank you, Sophia. Your head. Yeah. I was just curious. Thought. Okay. And then similar to last year, for those locations that were deploying the portable pumps or generators, that's going to be visible by the neighbors. We will do outreach to the community so they understand why those generators are sitting out there uh, in the streets. Um, also, like last year, we're going to do vegetation management within our service areas at our facilities along the McCallum Aqueduct, the right-of-way, um, and at Party Powerhouse along our power lines. The service area, that work has started this month and will continue for several months. Um, the McCallum Aqueduct right-of-way, that will be taken care of and be completed this spring, and the powerhouse work should be done um, this month as well. And the work will be done by District Forces, Civic Corps, and also our GOAT contract. And what you see in the upper right of that slide, um, we will be posting all that information on our website. So if people want to know when we're going to be out in their particular city and the dates, um, that will be on the website for people. And we know that a lot of people during the wildfire season do ask about when we're going to be there. So we found this to be very helpful. Ensure the goats get paid prevailing wage. And what, what part of the website is that on? Where is, on how do you the, navigate the, uh, to it? Carrots. Do you remember, Kelly? Um, I don't know if it's still working on the video. I can find out. I'm sorry, say it again. They're going to find out. They're going to find out. Okay. Just want to remind, we do have backup power at many of our critical facilities. So this building, the AMC, our treatment plant, the wastewater treatment plant, um, as well as all the yards. But if there is a larger outage, we do have our business continuity plans, and that helps us plan for these larger outages and manage our critical operations. Um, every year we do BCP exercises, and we thought um, a good theme for this year's BCP exercises was for all the work units to test their alternative work locations. Um, so that's ongoing and should be completed in this fiscal year. Um, and then if there is a larger outage, our emergency operations team will coordinate with our BCP coordinators to identify priorities and certainly develop a plan to ensure business continuity. I'm going to pass this over to Kelly. Okay, so, yes, yeah, similar to last year, um, we started communicating about PSPS early in the season. Um, it began in the July time frame. We did a lot of print outreach, including the customer pipeline article. We created a fact sheet, which we're planning on updating this year. And then we also issued some press releases. Again, you know, letting the community know that we're planning, we're prepared. You know, we have these generators that we're renting and that we'll be placing in their various neighborhoods. Um, and then similarly, we also had a series of social media messages, you know, kind of before PSPS, you know, during and then after. Um, we did, you know, uh, media releases, as I mentioned, and then we actually, you know, some media wanted to come out and see the preparations that we were doing, so we took them out and did interviews as well. Um, we're optimizing the, um, the PSPS webpage, which we'll be directing people to, to let them know if their pressure zones are affected. Um, we're optimizing that so that it's a lot easier for us to, to update quickly. Um, and then also, again, you know, we did a number of community meetings and briefings for folks. We did various presentations. We handed out um, a large number of the fact sheets to folks who were interested, including to, to fire um, officials and others. Um, and then we, um, you know, we're also just trying to make sure that we're, you know, active um, in, you know, in, in just in our regular communications with the other water agencies as well, sort of sharing, um, sharing messages with them so that they understand um, what we're doing and, and we uh, understand what they're doing. And again, the messages are largely the same. It's, you know, we're prepared, we have these generators in place, and then, you know, as you drill down farther, um, for those folks that are in the um, areas that are affected, it is, you know, conserve water so that we can um, preserve this resource. Um, so again, as we saw last year, we did a, a very um, kind of timed sequence of notifications when the PS, PS were, PSs were called um, or when they looked likely. We did messages to employees, um, a series to local elected officials, um, and then we also put things on Nextdoor um, and also targeted um, emails via WaterSmart to customers in the affected zones. Um, and again, we notified media, um, and they, um, you know, they covered it well. And um, as you can see from um, yes, and sorry, here's, the, here's a little bit more about the map. Um, you know, a lot of the other water agencies were very interested in the map work that we did, since I think this was fairly unique. Um, but we shared this with them and let them know how we had um, achieved this. Um, 
And then here you can sort of see the, the different responses. Um, in the pressure zones where we sent out those targeted messages, we saw um, a decline in um, water consumption, which um, again, I think um, proves that our, our messaging worked. It got out there and people can serve like we asked them to so that um, we could preserve this um, water supply in those neighborhood reservoirs. So that is the same plan that we were looking at this year. So it was the, uh, just following up on the question that was asked previously by President Young. So we have a, on our website, we have um, um, con construction and maintenance, and then we have a section under that called fire safety and suppression. And if you go to that seasonally, because we're not in a public safety power shutoff, we have a link to public safety power shutoffs. And during that season, we actually move that up to the front of the website so it's easy to get to. But right now, it's in all of the activities for fire suppression. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, uh, President Young. We're still, I, we're still oh, you're still on this. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Uh, and just quickly on the next step. So <laughs> we will be bringing the rental generator contract um, to you in April for consideration. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be preparing an RFP to purchase some of the generators, as well as uh, bringing a multi-year um, uh, generator rental. We have that meeting with PG&E. We're going to continue our PSPS preparation. And then we're also going to continue to participate in the CPUs. CPUC process, um, all the, um, the the proceedings are still ongoing and we're active in that. And that's to determine whether there's any reimbursement of cop. I mean, that the, sort of thing as well. There, as there's lots of discussions. Some of it's on their wildfire mitigation plan. Um, some of it is related to the um, CPUC's investigation of PG&E. Some of it's also related to uh, some direction the CPUC wants to provide to PG&E to improve their process going forward. Uh, including some of our comments, which is greater transparency, greater communication, and coordination. What was our final bill last year uh, that we spent on being prepared for uh, the uh, this event that took place, the two events? It was just shy of $1.5 million. Okay. Um, whether we get reimbursed or not, we don't know. So we're looking at spending at least that much going forward, in this, assuming that there's Two events, like we had. Assuming we have the two time. events, um, it's going to be a little more because we'll have the generators for two months longer. Okay. So you're probably looking at, if it's, everything else remains the same, it's probably closer to around 1.7. The million. gas prices are lower right now. Maybe that'll hold. Yeah. Well, I guess where I'm going with this and, and fits more into perhaps Kelly's wheelhouse, um, when we do our uh, monthly bill, our bill inserts, did we talk about what the cost was preparing for this? La what our cost was last year, because that has a rate impact, so people understand, and what we're potentially having to look at, assuming a two uh, similar circumstances of two shutdowns. It's just so people know that there's a financial cost that at currently the ratepayers are picking up, and you know if they don't like their rates sometimes, but then they go, oh, I don't want my water turned off either, so it may benefit. We'll, we'll uh, include cost in our communications. Thank you. John, uh, my local RAG, which we have in Castro Valley, I wrote a letter that laid out all of that. And people were very appreciative to hear. So whatever we do, I want to thank Kelly and his staff for helping me with the letter. Uh, it's a nice, tight, tight letter, but it got the message out of how much we spent, plus all the labor hours. That's what really blew them away. Um, Director Katz. Thanks. It's good to see uh, the district getting prepared. I appreciate the presentation and um, all, all the thought that's gone into uh, the success from last year and, and the preparations for this coming year. It's disappointing to uh, get uh, an early indication that uh, the, the cleaner generation is, isn't available in the rental market. Um, I uh, do hope that we can um, continue to look for opportunities. I, I am aware of uh, other uh, backup generation facilities that are, are not are not the uh, the battery um, uh, type of uh, power that we could have completely unrenewable. That that's a long way off, but uh, certainly natural gas uh, backup generation is available. That would be cleaner burning for a neighborhood scale. So if we have facilities that are within 2,500 foot feet of a residence or whatever our, our air district would, would recommend. Um, I, I think our, our purchases should uh, investigate those.
for the sites that um, are close to uh, sensitive receptors. I think we should uh, be uh, uh, thoroughly investigating that so that we're able to um, be good neighbors uh, at the facilities that are nearby. Uh, I'd like, oh, Go ahead. by way of the president, I'd like to point out though, uh, even though that's most desirable, in the stages that we had, the winds were 70 and 80 miles an hour. So I don't know what good any of the clean burning, if not available, uh, would have had, what the impact would have had, because it, the wind blew everything away. And it blew down my fence. <laughs> I just want to point that out. Okay, we'll take that into consideration. Um, it, if board willing, we can move on to another topic that isn't agendized. I, I'd like to share that um, we had provided uh, the board an information memo on the status of coronavirus efforts, and then and that was prepared uh, mid last week. And then on Friday, we provided a, a fairly comprehensive communication to all employees, including frequently asked questions and links uh, to other um, materials on the status of the coronavirus, but um, it continues, this su subject continues to uh, get more and more um, attention and focus. And so what we'd like to do is I'd like to turn it over to Craig to facilitate uh, adding this to the um, general manager's report so that we can have a discussion and provide you uh, more information. And my apologies to President Young and to the general manager. I was aware that this was uh, this topic of a memo to the board. Uh, but now I see that it was not added to the agenda. So in order to be within the, uh, 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 the, within the Brown Act, I want to be real careful here and make sure that it is properly added uh, to the agenda. So as I understand it, staff wants to present uh, a, uh, make a presentation to the board and allow the board to have a discussion about the, uh, coronavirus outbreak. And uh, this is a rapidly evolving uh, matter of, of concern. Uh, there's been updates and guidance that has been issued on a daily, if not an hourly basis since we have posted the agenda. Uh, and there is uh, a matter of urgency for uh, board consideration. So I believe under and under the Brown Act, a matter can be uh, put on the agenda after the agenda has been posted if the board makes two findings uh, with uh, five seventh uh, uh, approving the measure. The first would be a uh, finding that there is a need for immediate action or discussion, which cannot reasonably wait until the next regularly scheduled meeting. And two, uh, that the need for immediate action or discussion has come to the attention of uh, the district after the agenda uh, for the regular meeting was posted. So with these two as the uh, two items uh, under consideration, both of which will require, or each of which would require a, uh, a motion, uh, then it can be added to the, to the agenda. Move it. Do you have a motion for I'll the move. first finding? Second. M moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor of uh, the, 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 there is need for immediate action and discussion or discussion. I, I cannot wait until the next regularly scheduled can't meeting. Um, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. And I have a motion on the second finding that we the need has come to our attention following the posting of the regular agenda. So I would move. So, move. so uh, I think Lisa went first. So uh, moved by Director Mellon, seconded by Director McIntosh. Um, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, that's also unanimous. Yes, okay. Thank you. Mr. All right. General Manager, would well, you please give us a presentation on? All right, thank you for that process support. And so we have a, a co presenters here. We're going to start out with Clifford, Clifford Chan, Director of Operations and Maintenance, and then he'll be supported by Laura Acosta, Manager of our Human Resources Department. 
So this is uh, certainly a very serious issue facing our planet, and there is a lot of information out there in the news right now about the novel coronavirus as well as the COVID-19, um, the disease itself. Um, I just want to stress the safety of our employees and our ability to provide critical water and wastewater services to our customers um, is our priority. So this, as uh, Craig mentioned, this, there, the numbers, and this is rapidly changing, so um, I'm going to give you numbers that I had as of yesterday, but you know, worldwide there's over 100,000 cases uh, that were confirmed. In the United States, that number seems to, I can't seem to find the right number, but the last number I got was around 717. Um, in California, there's 129 confirmed cases, 79 uh, in the Bay Area, and certainly cases in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Um, so this is spreading rapidly um, because this virus is um, highly transmissible. Um, I do want to add that the CDC does report this time that most people in the U.S. have little immediate risk of exposure to the virus. Um, and they also suggest that so far most people who do get COVID-19 will experience a mild illness. However, those who are older and have pre-existing conditions um, are at higher risk. And there was a report from China um, that indicated that serious illness occurred in 16% of the people who were exposed. So the district does have a communicable disease emergency response plan. And these are the four objectives that was shared in the information memo, but I'll repeat them here. Um, so the four objectives are to reduce the transmission among employees, customers, and vendors, to maintain our essential operations and services, to minimize the impact to the district, um, and to provide employees with timely and useful information. The information that we're using comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, the California Department of Public Health, as well as our local public health departments. Um, the CDC also published interim guidelines for businesses and employers, and we are following those guidelines as far as um, the actions we're taking at the district. So within the plan, there are four levels um, uh, for emergency response. Level one, there's no impact. So assuming that there's really no influenza virus or any other sort of communicable disease, we're at level one, there's no impact. At level two, there's a general impact to the service area, but no impact to the district. And that's what we're seeing right now. You see impact uh, in and around our various cities and counties. Um, so we are at level two right now. And what that actions when we are at level two include increased awareness and increased communication and progressively higher levels of cleaning procedures at the district. Um, if we start seeing impacts to the district where we see higher absenteeism, or impacts to our supply chain, or other factors outside of our control. I mean, if you look at Italy, they locked down the entire country, you know, heaven forbid, but if you locked down a portion of our service area, we would certainly rise to a level three or level four. Um, when we're at level two, um, we have a communicable disease working group, and that work group got activated, and they met last week, and they're gonna meet again this week, and they will meet regularly. Um, if we get to levels three or four, before we go to level three or four, uh, we do consult with the general manager and make that determination. Uh, if we get to that level, then the emergency operations team would activate and all the activities will transition to the emergency operations team. So I'm just going to, the next two slides, I'm going to talk about what the district actions are so far. And when you look at the CDC guidance and the World Health Organization um, guidance, uh, and a very important piece is that we communicate information to our staff as well as try to counter misinformation. Um, and this is really specifically from the guidance that we see, and, and we see that people are understandably fearful and anxious. Um, so the communication is important. So um, Alex talked about the communication with staff. We sent out two messages in February to staff we sent out two messages in March, the last one on Friday from the general manager, and we will continue to send regular communications to staff. Last week, we met with all of the unions, and we will continue to meet with the unions and provide them updates as well and answer any of the questions that they may have. Uh, we also posted information on social media to assure our customers that the water is safe. Um, and then we also increased our cleaning procedures, um, certainly in the high touch areas, conference rooms, break rooms, um, the bathrooms. We are looking at, um, and you might see hand sanitizers in all the conference rooms, and we have those in the break rooms. We're trying to get more hand sanitizers and wipes 
Um, I will tell you right now, um, there is a shortage on hand sanitizer, so it's a little difficult for us to get, but we're, we're looking at our supplies to see if we can get the hand sanitizer. <laughs> that's, that's <positive. laughs> we've idea. we've seen various recipes for that one as well, um, and then we're also looking at some of the um, the hand sanitizer stations where people can just you see at the hospital, so you don't have to touch anything. Um, so as you enter conference rooms, the elevators, um, people have access to that, and we're also purchasing supplies, individual supplies for each of our employees, so they have their own uh, little kit as well. There's quite a bit of coordination planning. I talked about the working group being activated. We have also discussions with our senior management team. We're also assessing our IT capabilities. So looking at the possibility of doing more remote meetings, uh, also looking at the possibility for telecommuting as well. Um, uh, we talked about business continuities when I was talking about the PSPS and we're looking at the business continuity plans again uh, for this, as well as monitoring supply chains for disruptions. And the last bullet, and um, I'll, I'm going to finish up this slide and the next slide and let Laura talk about our policies and procedures. But we are looking at our policies and procedures to look at the benefits that are available to our employees. Um, I will stress uh, on my last slide that this is a fast-changing event. And if you look at our plan itself and if you look at all the recommendations from the CDC and the World Health Organization, uh, organizations, employers really have to be more flexible um, with how they respond to this and how they um, uh, look at their policies and procedures. Um, so there are other things that we're going to evaluate this week um, uh, of possible additional actions. Um, those could be restrictions on certain travel and conferences, um, also restrictions on non-essential public events and other possible events. Uh, if we do have to have public events, say for a particular project, we're going to look at possibility of conducting remote meetings so people don't have to show up but they do want to participate. Um, and then we're going to also evaluate uh, more telecommuting options. I will say that given the nature of our work, many of our employees cannot telecommute. Um, when we looked at it, about, you know, only about a quarter of our employees could um, you know, possibly telecommute. The, the rest of them, it's the nature of our work, uh, you're not able to do that. And before we get to any questions, Laura, do you want to talk about? Good afternoon. So we've been spending a lot of time talking about all of these issues. Um, the employee benefits um, are quite robust at the district. Um, we have sick leave, we have vacation, we have comp time off um, for those who have accrued comp time off. We also have um, the state offers paid family leave for when you need to stay home and take care of family members. All of these leaves are covered also under FMLA. Um, and, um, so far, it looks like we're doing okay. We did take a look at uh, what the number of employees the district has that may not have enough leave on the books for up to 14 days, and there are a small number of employees in that category, um, but we haven't had anybody report that they have contracted this yet. So if the if this situation gets more serious, we'll be able to come forward with some other ideas. Um, but right now, we look. it looks like the benefits um, are quite robust to help us um, cover our employees in this situation. We have our um, human resource regulatory coordinator who will be working with employees who may have a need for an accommodation if they have underlying health conditions, and we're starting to re receive some of those calls. Um, and we will be meeting with the unions as things um, evolve so that they can continue to bring information to us that we may not be aware of. So that's what we, where we stand on the HR um, portion of this. Anybody have any questions? I have a couple to questions. Okay, um, I'll go then. Um, so um, what are our um, protocols for employees to notify us about um, you know, their status or status of immediate family members? They, they would call in as normal. So if they can't report in because they're sick, they would let us know um, as normal, as they normally do now. But do we have a, I guess I'm wondering specifically about, we, but we don't ordinarily have people call if they have an immediate member of their family get infected with with the flu or, you know, Mom's somebody doesn't call in and say my wife has the flu, 
they if they come in they might tell people but do we have a specific a more specific protocol for that so, so typically if, if someone can't report in because they need to stay home to take care of someone who is sick I'm not they talking would call in. I'm talking about trying to contain transmission within the agency I guess I mean, it might be a, more of a Clifford question than an HR benefits question. Yeah, so, so I think this is part of the, kind of the, the rapidly evolving situation. We're actually putting together some additional questions and answers for the employees and supervisors. There are circumstances, um, and again, this is all part of the CDC guidance, where um, you may be asymptomatic, but you have someone at your home who is diagnosed with the COVID-19. Um, and based on that, um, the CDC puts out guidance for a risk assessment, and they categorize you as either high, medium, or low risk. So if you have a family member in your house um, that is diagnosed with COVID-19 and you are asymptomatic, the recommendation from the CDC is that individual will self-quarantine for 14 days. Um, so this is information, this is additional information that we do have to share with staff um, as this is all new information. Um, along with that response, we're putting together and we'll share with um, staff our response of if somebody is diagnosed, whether it's our employee um, with uh, the COVID-19, how do we respond to the work area? How do we notify um, all the employees that they may be in direct contact with? Um, what we expect of those particular employees? And again, we follow the, the risk assessment guidelines. And throughout all of this, and you know, Laura can speak to this better, we also want to make sure we maintain the confidentiality of our employees as well. But I, I will say that the, the CDC guidance for risk assessment is very clear um, and provides good guidance. So for example, I mean, there are certain exceptions, but you know, if I'm in an office and I sit next to somebody in an adjacent cubicle and they are diagnosed with COVID-19 um, under other circumstances, unless they have sneezed on me or you know, they live in my particular house, I, 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 it seems funny, but it's actually written that way because they talk about in terms of close contact, um, I'm considered low risk, and those employees should self-monitor, but they can still show up to work. If you do come under that category that they call close contact, then those employees would need to self-quarantine. Uh, then certainly if you become symptomatic, then other things trigger along the way. And are we doing any kind of, a, I don't know what you call it, probability assessment or you know, sort of looking at what we think you know, the scenario you know, what likely scenarios might be in the agency if we end up being like, you know, King County or somewhere. The, so the, the, um, the basis of our communicable disease plan assumes in the worst case scenario, 40% of our employees are affected. One of, uh, I have one more. Um, one of the things that's come up that I've been asked uh, actually was not this last weekend, it was the weekend before, I guess Costco ran out of bottled water and somebody, you know, posted it on our neighborhood, um, you know, the next door site and it's like, you know, this is getting serious, we're in like, and I'm like, I just scratched my head because I did not get it at all. Um, but, I mean, apparently some people are concerned that not just that our water is safe, but that we somehow won't be able to operate the utility. So I don't know if we could, add some of those, you know, people watch too many post-apocalyptic genre movies, I think, but um, uh, just, you know, that, that messaging about that or, you know, or what we know, how, you know, how close we en might end up being. And we were at that 40%, you know, sick number. Yeah, and, and part of the plan that we do have does talk about communicating not only with you know our customers in general, but also some of our key customers and stakeholders to make sure that they're aware of our circumstances and you know again to assure them that our water is safe to drink. But, but that Costco experience, I think if anybody's gone to Costco, you've had some sort of experience. I, uh, water wasn't an issue for me when I went to Costco, but um, what really affected me is they had no more rice. <laughs> <laughs> And we had a, paper a well, seems to be an issue. We had a well-received uh, social media post uh, where we explained that the water was unaffected, and so we can continue to message to our community. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I want to echo what President Young said. I've had any number of people say, what about the water? And, uh, you know, I've been
been telling them the same thing. The water is going to flow. That's the one thing you're going to be able to count on. Think back to the PSPS. You know, we made the water flow. And it's going to be clean and it's going to be safe. And no, the bugs aren't going to get in the pipe somewhere along the line. So, but yeah, I'm getting that question too. The, the, the other thing I wanted to raise is the HIPAA issue, which is, I, I don't know how to put this delicately. We need employees to understand that the medical issue is confidential. So if somebody is staying home for 14 days, we don't need them thinking, oh my God, it's COVID-19. Maybe they broke their leg skiing. And we've got to get the message out that we've got to respect people's medical confidentiality because there is penalty impacts if we go blabbing things all over. So I, those are my two cents worth. Thank you all Thank for you. being on top of this as usual. Thank you. Right. Well, I, I plan on agendizing this for a further update in a couple of yeah, weeks. Yeah, I think this is a regular item um, as we, you know, know more and as we are experiencing where we're at with it would be helpful, I think. I, I raised this question uh, with both Risha and Alex, and let's assume we, it's, we're a bad situation. And a number of board members are impacted, but the, by the time the uh, notice for the meeting has gone out, they find out that they may have it in order to do business. They can't call in because their name, the, they're not, it's not posted on here. Can the remaining board members take an emergency action like we did today with two thirds vote and be able to allow them to participate and change the agenda? So, okay. Maybe, so, <laughs> well, wait, look, can yeah. we uh, I just? I'm not sure that you were in the, on the conversation. You're right. No, I think I know. Right. But Risha did have some uh, oh. some information that we can. Yeah, right. No, I was part of that discussion. All right. So, if uh, you were planning on attending right. uh, the board meeting and then say Sunday night, you determine that you cannot make mm -hmm. it, so you'd like to teleconference in. As long as the information goes to the secretary's office by Monday morning, and we can give notice then to designated uh, entities like uh, the media that, that there will be a teleconference, then we can amend the agenda and, and call it a even a special meeting if we need to on 24 hours notice. Right. So that that but, works. But what I'm that's and I'm, I was aware of that where you had 11 o'clock the day before. Let's say somebody came down with it and it's, or several people come down with it and it's Tuesday morning. Then we need to make sure we have still a, uh, a quorum for members but here. Does that quorum, does that quorum have the ability to then do the emergency change on the agenda like we did today to talk about this? Yes, it then it would have to be by uh, unanimous vote at that point. Okay, that's so, all I needed to know. Well, okay. And the other issue of telephonic participation has to do with being at a place where you're, it's okay to have somebody else there on the phone. It's a public... You just put on your door, I have the coronavirus, you can come in, <laughs> and I'm participating by phone. Your choice. At your own risk. <laughs> so can I make so I apologize. I was aware that you had, somebody had asked that question previously. We provided guidance uh, on that, but this is a different question. And yes, it so is. So if we don't have the, uh, we have a quorum, then it has to be, but it, I mean, we have a quorum, uh, then it has to be by unanimous vote. Okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. And the public place <coughs> issue besides John's suggestion. So just wanted to make a clarification. If you do call in mm -hmm. after the agenda was posted, mm -hmm. then you need to call in by 8 o'clock because the 24 hours depends on what time the meeting starts. So if you were going to participate in a committee meeting that was scheduled already right. noticed to start at 8 o'clock, you need to call in as soon as possible Got so it. that we can properly notice we'll it. We'll call Alex's cell phone at home. Sure. <laughs> So any but, time. But, but, but Risha, the public place issue, the That's, public, I mean, is it really John's sign on the door is enough to say, hey, this is where the meeting is, but 
that's you that's what you have to do you have to but i have coronavirus and come in at your own risk i mean you can't, you can't it's not public if you're saying right so that's something we need to probably look at craig because it the brown act says that if you're going to teleconference mm -hmm. it has to be accessible to the public the public has to be able to hear and participate in the meeting so if i left my door open and i had the uh, bluetooth speaker on that would suffice well, yeah, but let's, I mean, that's, let's, let's just check yeah. that aspect. Of it. We'll come back with more information. I, I, I just welcome. recalling some of the advice from our health agencies that the, the standard appears to be three to six feet. So I think thinking about the location that you might potentially designate and reserving that defensible space, but still being accessible to the public in the unlikely event that someone were to show up at your home. Inside, you sit inside. With the screen, <laughs> it's Bluetooth speaker that you put right by the front door. Well, yeah. we'll provide additional information to try to clarify this. Okay. I mean, hopefully, that hopefully doesn't come to that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in addition, uh, on, as part of the GM report, we have the monthly report in the materials, and also the latest speakers bureau at your places. In the context of what we just talked about, if things continue to get a little bit worse, we may be um, dialing back, and this may actually impact um, uh, board members in the context of ward Thanks. briefings, which we may, if you're not, um, if it's not imperative that, that we have one, uh, we may wish to defer those until a little later, but that's probably a subject for next week, uh, depending on We just on wait till spring and it all goes away, I thought. <laughs> That's to be determined, to be seen. So, so thank you for your understanding. Well, their board briefings are not uh, an essential meeting. They're nice, but they're not required or... Appreciate your understanding, and so we'll just see how this, this gets, this evolves. Um, and that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Is that a question? Who is the manufacturer in Berkeley that violated our uh, pre-treatment report? Several it's times. Saki, right? It's the Saki manufacturer. Saki place. Didn't say in here. I was just curious. Yeah. yeah previously, we provided all the info, so we're um, just kind of giving a keeping you apprised in the monthly report. No, thank you. Okay. Um, I think that the next thing we have is uh, committee reports. Um, February twenty fifth. Um, Finance and Administration Committee minutes, um, and I believe the staff, the reports from the workshop that we had are all now posted on our website um, and have been. Um, and the minutes from the Finance Administration Committee are in our packets. Um, we have, um, we missed, this isn't, order's not right. Um, Doug, do you have a, a report we from the had planning, a planning committee, committee this morning? We meeting this morning, uh, and we covered several topics. Uh, we met to receive reports on the Arinda Water Treatment Plant Disinfection Improvements Project, uh, also an update on the private sewer lateral program. Uh, we also discussed property, uh, railroad property uh, acquisition, uh, initiation of eminent domain proceedings that will come to a future board meeting. In fact, the next board meeting, um, uh, and the annual recreation report. Uh, and we put off, due to time restraints, uh, the report um, on the McCollum Fall Run Chinook Salmon and Steelhead Returns that will be held over till the next uh, planning committee meeting. Thank you. Um, uh, other items for future consideration um, should be submitted to the general manager. We do have one item coming up on um, related to uh, retirement board participation that will be on our next agenda or? Right. We will preliminarily uh, bring that to the retirement board next Thursday and then we will uh, subsequently uh, bring it to the full board. Okay. Um, and with that, are there any additional director comments? Director Patterson? Yes, I have one. Um, I attended the West Oakland community um, meeting on TCE on the 3rd, and they had 90 residents there, and a big concern with the closure of McClyman's. 
and the movement of the students. Uh, it started with a parent forum, one facilitated by uh, the city of Oakland and another facilitated by the, the district uh, with the state representative and the county representative on hand. Uh, I think the major thing at issue was trust. The residents didn't seem to be trusting uh, the reporting agency primary. That's the school district. A lot of confusion about the lead, all the things that have happened in the past. So what they're trying to do is stabilize it, not have the community run amok, and not have them uninformed. So they are convening another meeting. Uh, uh, what came out of that was that the agencies involved directly could not all send representatives to the meeting, but they did have the word to the meeting. And so building trust is the most important thing. That was one of the reasons I went. I called the superintendent's office and made sure that at the next meeting she might avail herself and that the idea was not to throw rocks and stones and have a bunch of confusion, but to get people uh, who the community trusted and people in authority present and make everything clear because the information that was being passed around and questioned didn't fully get answered and the people who answered it were not the people in trust by the residents. So I just wanted to let the board know uh, the lead question came up again and they will be looking for updates in that material. So we may get called on. I didn't volunteer us, but we may get called on. I simply said to them that the reporting mechanism that is currently available is the school district website and that they have, a, uh, they have a place on there where you can go to and see the latest information pertaining to that subject. And that is called the official place to get the information. So basically, um, there will be another meeting. I'm, I'm not sure what the date is. They had some alternate dates. And I'll continue to monitor that but the district may get called on, so you may get some first-hand inquiries. Okay. I have uh, one item, which may seem like a long way away, but it'll be right around the corner. Um, I um, have, uh, it's related to our August board meetings. We typically, um, cancel our second August meeting um, and um, it creates an opportunity for a big longer vacation for some staff, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, um, my son and daughter-in-law um, due date for their, my first grandson is in not that part of August. It's earlier. <laughs> um, and so I will be, um, going back to Chile uh, in early August, which will cause me to miss our first, our first and probably only board meeting in August. Um, and um, uh, I've been debating about whether to suggest that we flip the switch and do um, our, do the second August board meeting and, and not the first August board meeting. And part of that was based on an earlier um, uh, recognition that schools seem to start earlier and earlier in August. Now they're starting even earlier in August. They start like August 10th or something like that. So it actually becomes moot in terms of 
That issue becomes moot in terms of um, August board meeting cancellations, although it might argue for canceling our second July meeting, which wouldn't, well, I guess it actually might help this situation. Um, uh, but I don't know how that impacts um, anything else. So I just, I don't n quite know um, uh, how to proceed, but perhaps it needs to get agendized as to whether we're contemplating a change in schedule for August or might want to contemplate a change in schedule for August. One thing, to, it's not a bad idea, Margaret, but one thing we need to be cognizant of, a lot of the staff I know. have probably, may have already made vacation plans for that latter part of August because right. that's traditionally when yes. it's Yes, no, shut. I know. I, I'm aware of that and I'm not. For the latter part of August for vacation. There's one other element that's I don't involved. think we can actually discuss yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. this. I'm just raising it as a... Yeah, so there's no decision being made, but uh, if an approach could be to, well, I could, to listen to what folks have to say, and then I could decide whether we agendize it for, um, or how we approach. Because normally we don't really deal with this until we get to... Um, until we get to the July time frame when we would cancel the, uh, the second uh, board meeting in August. Um, I can say that there are things that we do during the second board meeting in July that we would have to find other times to do. Uh, one of those things being, um, one of those things. Um, transferring. Yeah, I, I didn't, I wrote it down somewhere. Transferring the. Uh, Delete charges to the, the property tax rolls. Right. So we'd have to understand our the schedule impacts for district work, but we could probably make that happen. And then there's also the election appointment right. determination, but that actually doesn't take place. That happens uh, uh, actually that during in the... In between the two August dates, I so think. So what I could do is, is sort of, or what we could do, because I don't do everything, uh, is uh, put together a... Um, uh, an item uh, that would help the board appreciate what it means and then the board could uh, have a discussion about it and decide to take an action, if you'd like. Uh, Do you want to collect initial comments now? Uh, that might be helpful. Maybe we would not take an action. To, uh, yes, but if you can facilitate that. Uh, uh, first, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and I, um, th this year, because uh, we, we have a, a extra portion of the week um, in August, that we have kind of a fifth week uh, it, for a, a, one day in August. That uh, proposal would work for me, um, but I uh, ordinarily do uh, a plan to be on vacation uh, and wouldn't be able to do this on an ongoing basis. My, my feeling is there are certain events that happen in people's lives that merit recognition and congratulations indeed. Thank you. But also say, you're, that's excusable. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, if it would put up to me to, which I cannot do today, and so I'm not suggesting <laughs> anything of that effect, but I would consider that to be uh, something that is excused. I agree. Because that's... Damn important. It's family. That's my two cents. So you go and we can do what we normally do. Lisa's opinion, John's already stated his comment. Well, I mean, I, I also have both of them on my calendar until we delete one of many ways. So I, I'm flexible, put it that way. Uh, I have a, a vacation planned. Okay. River so it's going to affect more than one of us. That week. Good, you'll be gone and leave that. Margaret, we're gone? No, it's a commercial. Ah, oh, commercial, okay. Um, yeah, so I think um, that Bill didn't have any comments. So I, I think we've already got a board member who's impacted by another board member who's impacted by doing the reverse. So um, I think we just leave it. I, I will say that, that uh, you know, in, in general, it's interesting to for future reference to choose a different time, given what you said about the school schedules and stuff. Um, doesn't impact me, obviously, but um, 
does seem to make some sense to maybe take it as a different time. The, the legislature takes their vacation from mid-July to mid-August and, so and, and others run. and stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I do think in the long, now, I didn't realize that the schools had gone even two more yeah. weeks earlier, so which is... In the first week of August now. Yeah, they're all starting in the first week of August. Even Oakland is starting, I mean, or, uh, I was... That is summer vacation. Um, so, uh, you know, it makes, I think it makes sense in the, you know, as we look at next year's calendar to kind of think about that for all of our employees who have school age kids well, whose vacation we'll schedules are already inflexible um, that we uh, see if it, it, if it can't help them. Um. So shall we uh, come back uh, and have this be an item for 2021 discussion as it relates yeah, 2021 to 2021 calendar. and leave 2020 alone? Because yeah. we're already down the road here. Yeah. Okay. Then we'll uh, find a time, research a little bit what the implications are, and uh, share that. So just want to be clear, thinking about 2021, we're not talking about doing this year to year. We're talking about no, doing this going forward. You're talking about changing our convention, which is not formally stated anyway, right? But no. It's not. It's a practice. It's a practice. Right. It's a, but it's a practice that everybody is, used is already to. planning on. So. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, wraps us up for this meeting, and we are adjourned until March 24th at 1.15 p.m. Thank you.